welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Now, Robert Menzies is most commonly remembered as Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, of course, but during his first term as Prime Minister, he also served concurrently as Treasurer. So as Prime Minister and Treasurer in 1939, he took Australia into war with Germany and delivered his one and only budget in September 1939. Joining me to discuss Menzies as Treasurer is Dr John Hawkins from the University of Canberra. Welcome to Afternoon Light, John. Hello, Georgina. It's great to have you on, John. And Menzies as Treasurer, I really do think this is a little known fact. I think it could be in a trivia night question <laughs> at the King O Hotel in Canberra, surely. <laughs> Who was Australia's Treasurer in September 1939? Not many people would get the answer right. <laughs> no, he'd be one of the least known as a treasurer, although Bob Hawke had been in that category too. He was treasurer for one day. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay, well, I'll file that away for another trivia night too. <laughs> so what were Robert Menzies' views on economics going into the treasury portfolio in 1939? He didn't have an academic training in economics. He didn't seem to pay particular attention to economics when we look at his collection here at Melbourne Uni. It's not exactly overflowing with tomes on economics. What were his preconceived ideas and beliefs, do you think? I don't think he had particularly strong beliefs in economics. He once wrote, I'm no economist. And when I read interviews with people like Leslie Melville, Nugget Coombs, Roland Wilson, so all the senior economic bureaucrats at the time. They all, all paint the a picture dwarves. of... Uh, <laughs> yes, the seven, <laughs> yes. seven dwarves. They all paint a picture of him as certainly not having a passion for economics. So Melville said economics was something he left to other people. So it wasn't a, a passion and it wasn't something that he had studied in, in any depth. Looking at his academic records, both at high school and university, he did actually study political economy in one term. Whereas in law and history, he got very high grades, distinctions and so on. In political economy, he got a bare pass. So obviously it wasn't his strength. And mathematics was one of his weakest subjects. So again, that suggests economics wasn't really his area. Yes. It's interesting, though, you've written a PhD thesis on comparing eight different treasurers in Australia's history, and I noted when I read parts of your thesis, not your entire thesis, I have to admit, that you said that it's actually judgment and luck that are more important than having an understanding of economics for a treasurer. So maybe it didn't matter so much, did it? (laughs) Yes. I mean, sort of embarrassingly for economists, the most... (laughs) best qualified treasurer we we had in terms of economics was Jim Cairns, who even on his own admission was not one of the more successful treasurers. So yeah, it is having a good relationship with the Prime Minister, having luck of the world not going into a global recession or depression soon after you take office. They're some of the things that probably make for a good treasurer. Well, he would have had a pretty good relationship with the Prime Minister, given that was himself, (laughs) so (laughs) he could tick that box. At the time, in 1939, the economic orthodoxy was one of classical economics, wasn't it? Menzies bought into that, that he wanted manufacturers to reduce costs, which really meant cut wages. He wanted a conservative and tractionary policy, such as had been adopted in the Premier's plan of years gone by. So, I mean, that was sort of where, I guess, the position he came from going into this. Yes, so I think you could characterise him as supporting sort of orthodoxy virtually the whole of his career. And as you say, around the time of the Great Depression, time of the Premier's plan, he was adopting a very conservative stance. So, for example, there were two alternatives essentially to the Premier's plan forward. One was Jack Lang, who wanted us to stop making interest payments to Britain until after the Depression ended. (laughs) And that was... (laughs) pretty widely sort of rejected by people who said, well, it's breaking a promise and we won't be able to borrow again if we don't pay interest on our existing debt. Menzies, though, actually came out much more strongly against than most people. And he's quoted in the age of saying, it'd be better for Australia that every citizen within a boundary should die of starvation rather than default on our debt. 
So that was a a, a very hard line. Yeah, uh, that's a fairly indeed. extreme position, I would have thought. I wonder how that, that was <laughs> received in the uh, town hall meetings he attended. <laughs> well, not not well, I would imagine. Oh. It's also an indication, as a lot of people have written and many have said, that he was very different in his first term as Prime Minister to later, that he learnt a lot from his early mistakes. I don't think he would have said something like that in the 1950s or 1960s. No, he, I He was also not. very critical of the Theodore plan, which he described as more subtle, infinitely more attractive and infinitely more dangerous. And this was the alternative to the Lang debt repudiation yeah, so, plan. Can you go yeah, just explain so that a little Theodore's bit? Theodore's plan was essentially Keynesian before Keynes. So he wanted the government to borrow from the central bank and spend more to take up the slack in the economy. Whereas the sort of conventional wisdom at the time that Mendes was advocating was that you should be trying to balance the budget. So when you go into a depression and tax revenue drops, you should be cutting government spending. Nowadays, we'd say, well, that's only going to make things worse. So Mendes was essentially putting the conventional conservative wisdom of the day at that time. So why do you think in... April 1939, when, of course, Joe Lyons very sadly dies in office as Prime Minister and Menzies takes over, why does Menzies appoint himself Treasurer? I mean, there would have been others available. Yeah, I've not seen anywhere where Menzies himself has explained this, so it's a bit conjectural. I mean, it's partly lack of an alternative, I suspect. So, as you say, Lyons had died, Bruce was no longer in the Parliament, Page had quit the coalition, pulled the country party out of the coalition because of a bitter dispute with Menzies, who also was in the morning. So really the only alternative was probably Casey. And Menzies would have seen Casey as a rival and so maybe didn't want to give him the plat that Treasury gives a politician. So maybe been reluctant to appoint Casey for that reason. The other comment that was made in some of the press at the time was that Menzies was thinking that he probably could or should reform the coalition with the country party at some future time. And he'd then have to offer a senior portfolio to the country party. And sort of keeping the treasurer's portfolio sort of spare, in a sense, would facilitate that. I mean, if he gave the treasurer's job to a senior member of his own party, he'd then have to take it off them, and that would annoy them. He'd then have to find another senior job for that person and then take portfolio off somebody else and annoy somebody else and so on. So there'd be reasons there to also you know, keep it available so that it could be given to the country party. And that's actually what later happens because its portfolio is given to Arthur Fadden. Of course, who becomes, up until Peter Costello, Australia's longest serving treasurer. Menzies didn't appoint himself treasurer without any experience of the portfolio, of course. He had been acting treasurer in 1937 when Casey, who was treasurer at the time, was attending the Imperial Conference. And I find these quotes attributed to Menzies about that experience quite amusing. (laughs) He said he didn't entirely enjoy it. And I quote, I think I will be thoroughly relieved when Dick gets back from England. To be a treasurer immediately before an election is to be the most unpopular man in Cabinet. When I'm not being menaced, I am being wooed with soft words and bombarded with persuasive letters, most of which come from W.M. Hughes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the Treasury portfolio is sometimes called the poison chalice. On the one hand, if you do a good job, you can make your reputation and you can get the higher job. So Ben Chifley or Paul Keating would be examples. Stanley Bruce would be another, where being a competent treasurer made you the front runner next time that the prime minister sits vacant. But it can also destroy a promising career. So Jim Cairns or, or Joe Hockey might be given examples of people who were seen as possible future prime ministers, but a, what was perceived as a poor record as treasurer has have ended that uh, possibility. Yeah. So it is a risky portfolio and you can be unpopular because you're saying no to your colleagues who want to spend more money. Indeed, indeed. You're loved and loathed at the same time, it would appear. (laughs) So, of course, Menzies famously on the 7th of September 1939 announces that Australia is now at war, the declaration of war, because Britain is at war with Germany, Australia is now at war with Germany. And shortly after 
that declaration, he delivers his first and only budget in September 1939. And it's interesting, he described it as a budget for preparation and not a budget for conflict. And that sort of is really setting the scene for those first couple of years where Australia is really readying itself for war, even though it's in war, it's readying itself for the war that will come to its shores. How did this budget deal with the onset of World War II? As you said, it was prepared just before the war was announced. So I think, I get the impression that sort of Menzies was expecting a war, but maybe not quite as quickly as it happened, because the budget was being prepared sort of on the assumption that there wouldn't be a war. So he, his words in the Parliament were, it's prepared in a time of peace, it's been delivered in a time of war, it must be regarded as having extremely tentative character. So within you know, in a days have been delivered, he was sort of thinking, well, we'll probably have to have another budget before too long, realizing it, given what's happened to us. Yeah, which is exactly what did happen, of course, in November when Spender delivers yet another budget. <laughs> so it was well forecast. Menzies appoints Spender, who is a political rival and an incredibly impressive individual. I mean, he goes on, of course, to be external affairs minister. He's the minister who carries through the ANZUS negotiations with the United States and we sign it in 1951. He ends up serving as a judge on the International Court of Justice. The list of his achievements, Australia's ambassador to the United States. List of his achievements is legion, but He never, of course, becomes Prime Minister because Menzies is always there and Menzies is always trumping him in that political race. And Menzies was very good at managing his political opponents internally, wasn't he? So he was always sort of appointing them to like not great roles (laughs) or (laughs) areas where they weren't going to shine too much. Or so it is said. Yeah, I mean, Casey to ambassador to the US, Barbic to the High Court and so on. That's right, yeah. But why did he turn to Spender, do you think, so quickly, appointing him as Assistant Treasurer and then, of course, quickly as Treasurer, ending Menzies' very short term as Treasurer? I suspect Menzies wanted someone who could do a lot of the day-to-day paperwork as as Treasurer, given his main job as Prime Minister would have kept him fairly busy, one would imagine, particularly during a war. Um, We talked about the fact that it wasn't an obvious candidate other than Casey and why he might not have wanted him. Um, Spender, unlike Menzies, had done quite well at university studying in his studies of economics. He got distinctions for second and third year economics. So he was somebody who knew about the area. He was, though, very new in the parliament at that stage. So I could see why you might not want to appoint him treasurer. You might want to assess what he was like performing in the house, what his sort of political uh, Naus was like. And if he didn't measure up, it's reshuffling an assistant minister is, is no big deal, whereas sacking a treasurer is a bit in his cycle. So I could see why you might want to try him out in the more junior role first and before you appoint him treasurer. But a very talented person with interest in economics and some talent for it. So I think probably quite a good choice if you're going to choose an assistant minister to, to help you manage the treasury portfolio. You don't think there was any bad blood, though, with the fact the way Spender had come into the parliament? I mean, he'd come in as an independent. He'd knocked off the Minister for Defence in Joe Lyons' government, Archdale Parkhill, for the seat of Warringah. And Archdale Parkhill was this sort of elder statesman on the centre right of politics and had been a really important figure in the um, (laughs) liberal or non-Labour history. And then Spender comes in, this sort of upstart, and knocks him off as an independent, which I think is interesting, of course, reflecting on other Spenders, his grandchildren, who have also come in knocking (laughs) off liberals as independents. Didn't get a sense in your research there was any particular bad blood there. He was rewarded with this post and, of course, then the ultimate promotion to treasurer. I'm sure there would have been some people in the party who would have regarded him as an upstart and, and as with um, his granddaughter Lega, they would have resented losing a blue ribbon liberal seat. And that might be another reason why Menzies didn't want to appoint him treasurer immediately because it would have ruffled a lot of feathers that this upstart being rewarded for his treachery as some people probably would have seen. I'm not sure that Menzies himself, though, would have been too upset about Park Hill and being overthrown because Park Hill had been a close mate of Billy Hughes He'd contested the deputy leadership against Menzies and I think he saw himself 
as a future leader. So, you know, Robert Menzies may have been in some ways quite happy to see the back of him. So he, he probably <laughs> didn't hold that against um, <laughs> Percy Spender. Yeah. So Spender's quite an interesting treasurer, isn't he? Because he's quite an enthusiastic Keynesian, isn't he? And so this is a divergence from where Menzies was coming from, being part of the classical economic orthodoxy, you know, cut spending and keep a tight budget. Spender's sort of quite different. Does that trouble Menzies? And then also where do these ideas come from for Spender? Is it from the Treasury or is it from the expert, of course, the <laughs> economic expert? Yeah, well, Menzies was very much sort of conventional orthodoxy. Spender was much more open to the new Keynesian ideas that emerged relatively recently at that stage. When he was at Sydney University studying economics, he studied under Irvine, who was a progressive figure on the left. And Spender does seem, economics and in other matters, to be sort of fairly open-minded and interested in new thinking, willing to explore ideas and so on. So I think he was, and a sort of intellectual, so he was receptive to these new Keynesian theories in a way that maybe Menzies wouldn't have been. Also, around about that time, you have what was known as the F&E Committee, Financial and Economic Committee, which was a committee of some of the leading economists in the country, particularly academics and also people like Naga Coombs and so on. And they had sort of absorbed some of this Keynesian theory. So you had them feeding that into Spender, whereas Misery Mac McFarlane, the Treasury Secretary at the time, was more the given the conventional line. So you had these new thinkers, and if you were an assistant treasurer interested in listening to them, um, then you'd be influenced by these new ideas. You would be wanting to promote them yourself, which he did. So let's just go to Stuart Misery Mac McFarlane, the Treasury Secretary, who was a long-term Treasury Secretary. How did he get that moniker? That's pretty terrible. <laughs> I presume <laughs> that he was a portent of doom, <laughs> often across cabinet briefings. Is that why? <laughs> yeah, a very dour figure, fairly unimaginative. I mean, the sort of first half of his existence, the Treasury is based on an accounting organisation, right? because you know, macroeconomics basically didn't exist until, until Keynes. And I think Spender, and I think maybe Fesson as well, sort of referred to McFarlane as presenting what he called his sums. So he'd sort of say, well, this is how much we're going to have to spend, but at a minimum we'll have to spend this much, so this is how much tax we'll need to raise to fund that, and there's your budget. And so there was no idea of what should we be doing given what the state of the economy is. Should we be expansionary because the economy is in recession or do we need to restrict private spending to direct resources into the military because there's a war on or something. So it was it's a very sort of mechanical accounting approach and apparently delivered in a very dour, unenthusiastic, unexciting manner. And that had been really the approach, hadn't it, of Joe Lyons when he was Prime Minister. He'd very much seen running the country, running the sort of the economy as the same as running your home economy, your home budget, that, you know, you had a certain amount of money coming in and it couldn't exceed the money going out. And they were, these leaders, of course, were very heavily influenced by the, the really, really difficult time during the Great Depression. But it was quite, in a way, unsophisticated, wasn't it? As you say, there wasn't really this sort of idea of how you can pull the economic levers of the country through macroeconomic policy, be it a Keynesian approach or a market-driven Friedman-esque approach. These were pretty much just accountants who were saying, well, this is what's coming in, this is what's going out, and if we have debts then we and loans, we're going to have to pay the interest, and how do we cover the interest repayments? And, I mean, overall that, of course, was an attempt to make sure there was full employment, but that was really the level of sophistication they got to, wasn't it? Yes, in the case of Lyons, I think he was influenced by his period as Premier and Treasurer of Tasmania. And particularly in a small state, there's not much you can do about influence in the national economy or anything. It is all about making sure that your revenue and your expenses are balanced. And I think he brought that sort of mindset with him when he became Treasurer and Prime Minister. It's interesting, in the Menzies collection here at the University of Melbourne, DG Copland has given Robert Menzies his book in 1942, Towards Total War, and Copland, as I'm sure you'll know, John, an economic advisor to prime ministers during that time, and he actually ended up 
co-authoring with Menzies a book, Post-War Reconstruction in Australia. But he was the Commonwealth Prize Commissioner, a very important figure. But what I found interesting is the inscription in this book, and it says to R.G. Menzies, who laid the foundations of total war in Australia against much opposition and confusion and established the place of the expert in the war economy. And I was reflecting on this. This was obviously reflecting quite a change in the way the government, ministers, the prime minister were taking advice. So either in the past, you're taking advice from your treasury officials, Misery Mac, (laughs) McFarlane, but in this crisis context, you, of course, had the f and committee, economists who were outside of the bureaucracy, who were coming in, giving advice and bringing in new ideas from the United Kingdom, from Keynes. This was quite an innovation, wasn't it? A real change in the way governments were sourcing advice and implementing that advice against the wishes of the Treasury. Yeah, and that was a, an aspect of this period that there was – more use of particularly the expertise of economists. So, I mean, when Copeland says it's good they're using experts more, he's in a sense saying it's good they're using economists like him more. Yes. <laughs> and he had a certain view, didn't he? He was more a classical economist rather than the, you know, Nugget Coombs who was very much of the Keynes. The- yeah, I'd, I'd probably put Copeland somewhere between sort of classical and Keynesian. So, he, um, I mean, the Premier's plan was not as completely conventional and traditional, but it wasn't going as far as the more Keynesian-style Theodore plan. So I put Copeland somewhere in the middle, and I think he became more Keynesian over time. And as you say, it was it was probably the leading economist of his day and had his finger in a lot of pies. He was involved teaching, obviously. He was one of the founders of the economic society, one of the largest contributors to their journal, The Economic Record. He was a good networker, so he knew Keynes and met with him when he went to London. As you say, he was prices commissioner and he had a string of other jobs. He always struck me as someone who never seemed to settle into a job. He seemed to always be looking for the next one, very sort of restless sort of character. <laughs> Founder of CEDAR. A, I mean, a, a very an ambassadorial post and so on. One so, a yeah. very significant legacy, and I am pretty sure there was a lecture theatre named after him here at Melbourne Uni. So he even had that. Although they, <laughs> they, they demolished that building, so it no longer exists, unfortunately. I uh, also got one at ANU, I think. Oh, fantastic! Oh, well, and hopefully that lives on. So, <laughs> at Spender as treasurer during World War Two, the early stages of World War Two, he's obviously got a critical position in funding the war effort and making sure that the Australian economy doesn't collapse under the the weight of the expenditure that's required to prepare us for attacks on our shores and of course defending other other territories around the region. What were the key innovations that Spender introduced with all that advice he was getting from Giblin and Copland and and Coombs? Well, not to fear taking on a bit of debt was one of the main things and also not to fear borrowing from a, a central bank. They also had some uh, schemes that didn't all get fully implemented, trying to sort of compulsory savings or deferred consumption uh, schemes and also sort of thinking in terms of increasing taxes as a way of reducing private spending and, and getting more resources into the, the war effort. So it was uh, more Keynesian, more sort of interventionist. They also relied on things like price controls, which isn't necessarily Keynesian, but it was also a move away from economic orthodoxy. And what was the impact of those price controls on the community? I mean, they're always pretty popular, aren't they? Stop greedy <laughs> businesses putting up prices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they often make goods unavailable, though. I mean, rental ceilings tend to mean that landlords don't maintain buildings and so on. So they can sort of work for a limited time, but the longer they're in place, the more problems there are. And then you end up having to introduce rationing sometimes, for example, to make the price controls work. And then that's sort of very unpopular. So people like John Dedman became very unpopular with running the rationing scheme during the Second World War and uh, all the restrictions on whether your suit could have lapels and all this sort of thing. (laughs) Spender also wanted to learn some of the lessons from World War I and I think there had been some concern in World War I over the excessively generous treatment of wealthy investors in war bonds. 
So what was he thinking then in relation to those sorts of policies in order to fund the war effort? I think he was looking to try to make sure that every, sort of everybody contributed. And was that, that generally that accepted burden... when you read the sort of media reporting at the time were people just accepting of the fact that their taxes were going to go up and there were price controls which would put pressure on suppliers and manufacturers and we were all in this together and we all had to take a hit? I think there were, probably was fairly broad acceptance. I mean, there was always grumbling about particularly rationing and so on. But it was an existential conflict, I guess. I mean, it was very different to the war in Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq or something, where people realised we need to stop this or we're going to become a Japanese colony. So I think there was a sort of grudging acceptance that this had all had to be sort of paid for somehow and that we'd have to put up with not being able to buy everything we want and put up with higher taxes and so on to make sure that we won the war. And going into the war in 39 and 40, what was Australia's economy like? Were we in a good position relative to other countries or were we, were we in a parlous state and we were going to dig ourselves an e- into an even deeper hole? We probably had a stronger recovery from the Depression than a lot of countries did. Admittedly, we had a worse depression than some countries did, but we seemed to kind of, by the late 30s, we'd come out of it. And were there reasons for that? I mean, we had some very good harvests, didn't we? And commodity prices were high, so that, of course, benefited Australian farm exports. Yeah, so we were, even more so than today, we were reliant on one sector for our exports. And instead of mining, it was agriculture. So uh, wool and wheat were the, the big things. And so if wool and wheat prices were high, which are basically out of our control, then the economy would do very well. And commodity prices were strengthening through the 1930s. I don't know that there was a lot of sort of economic reform or, or anything going on in the 1930s. I think we were mainly benefiting from that uptick in, in commodity prices. And really the Premier's plan was not as restrictive as some other countries adopted. So that probably helped a bit in terms of getting us out of the depression. So Spender is a short-lived treasurer, like his predecessor, (laughs) Robert Menzies, and he was regarded as having done quite a good job, wasn't he? But in October 1940, he's moved from the Treasury, and of course, we then have Arthur Fadden, Country Party treasurer, come in to the post. But before we move on to Fadden, what was the report card of Spender as treasurer? Never seen any indication that he was moved from Treasurer because of any dissatisfaction with his performance. After the 1940 election, they needed to reform the coalition with the country party. Page was no longer the country party leader, so that moved that impediment to it. You had to give the country party a senior position, and so Fadden got the Treasurer's job and Spender shoved aside. The fact, though, he was given another very senior cabinet position suggests that he was regarded as having done uh, reasonably well as treasurer. So on to Fadden. Now, Fadden's views on economics were different, again, from Spender's. He wasn't a Keynesian, or at least a doctor of Keynesianism in 1940 when he was first appointed to the treasury. So what did we get then? Was this a reversal back from the Spender approach that had been so heavily influenced by the economic experts in the F&E committee? Yes, so Fadden, unlike Spender, wasn't an intellectual, wasn't an economist. He was an accountant, at least, so he had he was sort of numerous. And he wasn't really sort of anti-Keynesian, but he, yeah, he wasn't sort of progressive and particularly interested in, in these new ideas. So he would more follow what Treasury suggested to him. Over the course of time, Treasury itself, though, is, is becoming more, more Keynesian. So the sort of advice he's getting from Treasury has, becomes less sort of old-fashioned becomes more Keynesian and he sort of more or less follows along with that. So Roland Wilson was very influential. I I think Fadden had a lot of respect for Wilson, although he wasn't above playing a few practical jokes on him. Some story about him once leaving a rotting fish in his bed. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Sounds revolting. (laughs) (laughs) So Fadden's promoted to treasurer after the 1940 election, as you said. And in November 1940, brings down his first budget. What did we get with that first budget from Fadden? So a little bit more conservative. Fadden was particularly worried about in- inflation, so he was a bit more cautious than Spender. And that uh, had come out been. from the experience of the Depression, the Great Depression, presumably that concern about inflation and evils of it. 
I'm not quite sure where it comes from, but it's certainly something that in his speeches he sort of talks about a, a concern about. He, though, has one of the most Keynesian budgets, in a sense, in his power budget, with Keynesian working in the opposite direction of what we usually think about it, not trying to stimulate the economy out of recession, but trying to crunch the economy because inflation had got too high. And that was driven by a commodity price boom. So it was the Korean War had increased demand for wool, American soldiers and others needing woolen jackets. So the wool price had been very high, and that meant the farm sector was very wealthy. And, of course, the farm sector back in those days was a much larger proportion of the economy than it is now. And that was spilling over into the rest of the economy. The economy was overheating. Inflation was reaching what's still, in fact, an all-time high. And so they felt, well, there's a need to restrict the economy, and so we'll use fiscal policy a tighter fiscal policy as a way of reducing those inflationary pressures. That thinking was right. The problem was that they were too slow doing it. So by the time the measures were sort of implemented and started to have their effect, the commodity price cycle had turned. The wool price was dropping quite a lot. And so inflation was already on the way down. And so you probably exacerbated what would have been a slowing in the economy anyway. And so that sort of timing wasn't great. And that led to a lot of unpopularity for Fadden as treasurer. I think he said at one stage I could have had a meeting with all my supporters in a telephone booth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and as you said, that was, of course, in the 1950s after Menzies becomes Prime Minister for the second time in 1949 in coalition with the Country Party. And Fadden, I think, is treasurer in that stint for over eight years, which was extraordinary and was the record until Peter Costello overtook it in 2005, I think it was, it would have been. But Fadden's budgets during his first term as treasurer in 1940 and then in 1941, I mean, he was very focused, of course, in how to pay for that vastly increased military spending and, as you say, was very concerned about rising inflationary pressures. But he was very concerned about relying on more and more credit, wasn't he? He really was focused on getting the states to try and yield their income taxes to the federal government, which was tried and tried again by successive treasurers, wasn't it, and always failed. (laughs) Yeah, so he was worried about debt. And so he was sort of finding it difficult because he also particularly want terribly high taxes either. And very hard to cut spending when you're having to spend an awful lot on, on the war effort. So yeah, those were sort of quite a troubled period for him. He also stays treasurer whilst being prime minister, although, of course, that wasn't a terribly long period, I think 40 days and 40 nights. Yes. <laughs> you know, as prime minister. That's right. I think he said something like, I barely had time to wear a path out to the backyard toilet before I was out of office or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, his budget, of course, in 1941 didn't pass through the parliament. I think two independents withdrew their support from the coalition government and voted against the budget. And of course, then we end up with John Curtin as prime minister and Ben Chifley as treasurer. But what was your report card for Fadden Mark I as treasurer? Fairly good, but it was only a a short period in the exceptional circumstances of war. So it's sort of hard to judge him because he was was facing challenges that very few other treasurers had faced, but I think reasonable job. For the remainder of the war, of course, we had the government of John Curtin and then John Curtin unfortunately dies in the final year of the war and is replaced by his treasurer, Ben Chifley. Chifley's economic program, he was considered quite a good treasurer, but his economic program becomes sort of in the end incredibly controversial. He keeps war rationing on way after the end of the war. He tries to centralise a lot of industries and, of course, most controversially, the banking industry he tries to nationalise. Do those sort of things go against Chifley's record as an economic manager, do you think, or is his record considered unblemished? (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't say unblemished. I'd say, on balance, 
it's fairly well regarded. I mean, a lot of people thought that there would be a major recession after the end of the Second World War, that it would be very hard to transition all those returning soldiers into jobs in the private sector without either having a big recession or having a major surge in inflation. So handling that transition without either a big surge in inflation or a big jump in unemployment, I think is something you'd give him very high marks for. Keeping some of the rationing, particularly the petrol rationing, I think was a as a, it was certainly a political mistake and probably an economic mistake as, as well. So, I mean, partly it was motivated by trying to help the UK. So in a way, it was odd that such an ardent Anglophile as Menzies ended up being the beneficiary of it. But in general, I think I'd give Chifley a good uh, report card. Also, in terms of, sort of economic reform, he sets up the Commonwealth Bank as a central bank. So that's the first step towards having a, a sort of coherent monetary policy. He brings in a lot of young, bright economists, initially in the Department of Post-War Reconstruction, which he was also the Minister of for quite a while, and then later in the Prime Minister's Department, and adopts sort of Keynesian policies. So it basically puts in place the macroeconomic structure, which broadly served the country quite well through the 50s, 60s, early 70s. So when Fadden comes into the Treasury in forty nine, do you see, I mean, obviously there's big reversals around, you know, the plans to nationalise the banks and the petrol rationing and war rationing was all abandoned. But did you see Fadden continuing on this sort of Keynesian trajectory? I mean, you said with the horror budget, it was a Keynesian budget, although sort of was focused on combating inflation rather than driving government investment in big sort of nation building projects and national development. Was Fadden really an inheritor of Chifley's program in, in some respects? Yeah, in some respects. And in many ways, he sort of continued on the sort of, particularly the macroeconomic area, continued on with the sort of Chifley framework and also the sort of personnel. So in the 1949 election, Fadden and Menzies were quite critical of Nugget Coombs, the Commonwealth Bank governor. After the election, they have a yarn and said, look, don't, don't worry about that rubbish I said you in the election. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and similarly, there was no wholesale sackings of Treasury staff or anything like that. So in that sense... It's sort of a continuation. By this time, Treasury itself had become much more sympathetic to Keynesian sort of policies and they were sort of broadly uh, continued. We were saying earlier that Menzies was essentially orthodox in his economic attitudes, but by the 1950s, you know, Keynesianism had become the economic orthodoxy. So I think by the 50s and 60s, Menzies was Keynesian because that was the new orthodoxy. Yeah. I mean, of course, the 1950s, the period of Arthur Fadden's treasury ship, end up being a golden age of economic growth for Australia. And you can say it's down to him, you can say it's down to luck. It probably was a combination of the two, but that's pretty good for his report card. Yes, if you evaluate treasurers by economic growth, he looks pretty good. <laughs> Well, John, thank you so much for today's discussion on Menzies as treasurer and, of course, his successes in Spender and Fadden. It's been absolutely fascinating and I think lots of trivia trivia questions have been answered (laughs) and stored away for the future. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Georgina. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 